Hello, I'm Father Columbus Stewart, Executive Director of the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, or as we call it, HIMMEL. HIMMEL is an international organization based out of Minnesota in the United States. Our work is solely funded by donations and grants. Our purpose is to preserve and share the world's handwritten past to inspire a deeper understanding of our present and future. Handwritten books, manuscripts, are clues documenting what humans over thousands of years thought important enough to share. It is incredible what these voices from the past have to tell and teach us. Therefore, we photograph manuscripts around the world so their contents can be available for centuries to come. We place a special priority on manuscripts located in regions endangered by war, political instability, or other threats. Preservation begins through partnerships with local libraries, agreements that allow Himmel to make digital images of the manuscripts in their collections. Digitization is done entirely through local teams to whom we provide equipment, training, technical support, and payment for their work. We photograph everything in a collection because we don't know what might be significant in the future. Copies of the digital images are given to the repository that holds the manuscripts. Another copy comes to Himmel in Minnesota. Himmel employs catalogers and other staff to ensure that the digital images of these manuscripts are identified, supported for long-term access, and are made freely available to the public via our website. One of the many advantages that comes with doing the work that we do is that my team and I meet with extraordinary people from every corner of the world. We learn about their culture, their present experiences, and how they see the future. This series gives me the opportunity to introduce these extraordinary people and their stories to all of you, as well as to ask them questions I never had the chance to ask before. It is my belief and it has been proven again and again throughout history that when we truly listen to what others have to tell us, we build an understanding. And that is always a good foundation for collaboration. And of course, manuscripts and our written human knowledge are always at the heart of these encounters. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on this journey to listen. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hello and welcome. I'm Father Columbus Stewart, the Executive Director of the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library. And I'm delighted to welcome you to episode two of season three of To Listen, A Global Journey. Those of you who followed our series know that in seasons one and two, we looked at international and national partners of Hemmel's work, as well as scholars who are working in the field relevant to the manuscript traditions that we preserve. In season three, we're focusing more on manuscripts and objects, the actual material culture that we and our partners are preserving. And in this second episode of season three, we turn to our work in the island of Malta, celebrating the 50th anniversary of Himmel's involvement with this incredibly multifaceted and rich cultural tapestry in the Mediterranean. My first visit to Malta was in my early years of being executive director. And I must say it was a day when Malta was experiencing freezing temperatures and hail, which I think happens once a century. <laughs> but my, my first introduction was not the most pleasant, but my subsequent <laughs> visits in the summer were fantastic. A gorgeous place very, very rich culture, and literally layers of history, which reveal themselves in so many ways. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guests. Happy to welcome my colleague, Dr. Daniel K. Gullo, who is the director of the Malta Studies Center at Himmel. And I think your full title, Daniel, is the Joseph Mikolev, director of the Malta Studies Center. Joe Mikolev, longtime friend of Himmel, and really the prime mover behind our work in Malta some 50 years ago. So welcome, Daniel. Thank you. Great to be here. 
And it's, it's wonderful to give you a chance to highlight the amazing work that you've done. And then our special guest today, our international guest, is Liam Gauchi, who's the senior curator of the Malta Maritime Museum, which has been undergoing some renovation recently and will reopen gloriously, we hope, sometime in the autumn of this year. In 2007, he joined the museum after completing his studies at the University of Malta. And since working at the museum, he finished his MA in history at the University of Malta and has curated over 10 international exhibitions. In 2016, he published his first monograph entitled In the Name of the Prince, Maltese Corsairs, 1760 to 1798. While writing his book, Liam volunteered at the notarial archives archiving the Corsair documents found in that de depository, a collection that Hemel has been very involved in. His main history is the maritime history of Malta in the long 18th century. He's also a director of the government-owned Taste History brand, which we all want to hear more about, which promotes the sharing of knowledge of historic foodways. And he is a visiting lecturer at the Department of Archaeology at the University of Malta. So it's great for me to talk with both of you. Uh, I should have added that I've known Daniel since he was a graduate student here at St. John's. He's been curator now, not quite for 10 years, and recently director of the Malta Study Center. And to meet one of his friends is a great pleasure. So I wonder if the, the two of you, I'll let you decide who goes first, could say a little bit about how you actually met, connected, and then developed work together. Well, if you don't mind, Liam, I can introduce that and then you can carry it on and talk about some, you know, details on your part. But we met briefly back in 2014, right after I was hired at the Inquisitorial Conference in uh, Birgu. And uh, Heritage Malta had uh, recently renovated the Inquisitorial Palace and Museum. And there was a major conference that was held in celebration of this opening. And that was the first time I had to meet Liam very briefly. Um, subsequently to that, uh, the Malta Study Center began a very important, unique project to digitize the archives, rare prints and uh, drawings at Musa, which is the uh, National Museum of Fine Art in 2017 and 2018 in preparation of celebrating Valletta as the cultural capital of Europe and the moving of the collection to its new facility at the Auberge d'Italie. At that time, I was lucky because Liam was with my colleague and our mutual friend, Emmanuel Budijic, who is a professor of history at the University of Malta. And they invited me to speak on their radio program on history of objects. And that was the first time I really got to spend a really long time talking with Liam. And I knew at that moment we would become not only great friends, but you know, great colleagues in preserving the cultural heritage of Malta. First of all, I, I'm so, so, so honored to be, to be here today talk, talking uh, with you gentlemen about, about what we do uh, and, and our mutual collaborations. But I would like to add that in 2014, I, I was, I was um, it, uh, the word shy um, does not give credit to, to uh, how, how I, I wanted, I, I so wanted to talk to, to, to Daniel about how happy I was with the work that him does um, in Malta, because it was always something that as a student, and now today with my students, I'm always harking on about of how, how this is the way forward. This is the future. And this is how you can be studying and analyzing and learning about our archives from the comfort of your own home. And that is that is something which which to me, uh, we must admit that that in Malta, it was in 2014, it was Star Trek technology. You know, it, it was that sort of thing. Will I tell him that, that I, I like I'm so happy to, to, to meet him and all that? And then we, we got the, 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 the interview um, on our radio radio program with, with Manuel, uh, Emmanuel Buttigieg, Professor Buttigieg, where there the ice broke and we started talking. And, and you suddenly realize that, that, you know, although we are separated by, by the little lake that is the, the, the Atlantic, um, uh, 
we share mutual goals, mutual dreams with regards to our collection, with regards to, to what we do on our day-to-day jobs, uh, the same problems. Um, uh, but at the end of the say, at the end of the day, one passion, and that is um, talking about uh, and and preserving our history, but more importantly, giving it a context today and trying to share it, to share it with the whole world if, if needs be. So knowing Daniel quite well for uh, I think actually decades now, and then <laughs> learning of, of your history or your interest in the history of food and historic food waves, my hunch is that your bond was partly forged over some good food and perhaps some wine. Is that a reasonable assumption? Well, if you're in Malta, <laughs> we are going to share a good bottle of wine and a nice plate of pasta, rabbit, and anything that you can think of which reminds you of a Mediterranean diet. I just push the envelope a little bit more and, and, and we go for authentic food. Mm -hmm. from the 18th century mostly because again we are extremely lucky uh, when it comes to archival material one depository which which inspires me which helps me so much in 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 doing this job uh with regards to taste history is literally the tribunale armamentorum that himmelis is currently uh digitizing full of documents and and just to give you one example you're going around and you, you browse through the pages and you find the recipe for a very spicy salami. Uh, we would call it salami. Back then it was salsiccia. And it's literally a shopping list of a corsair captain who did not pay his butcher. And the butcher took him to court. And there you find these ingredients. And so luckily I have uh, chefs that, that really, uh, you know, have to to listen to every little detail that I tell them. We recreate that and you will have it on a plate at the Malta Maritime Museum or, or by this time now um, in, in any museum owned by, by Heritage Malta. And there you can actually taste history, but uh, with a small H where, where, where people suddenly realize, oh, I see. There were no potatoes in Malta in the 18th century or mm oh, I see, we were drinking champagne in, in 1740 Malta. Um, so these are, these are the little things that, that we are doing. And, and obviously, Daniel was, was, was one, of, one, of, one of those. I must say, there were times that, that he had to experiment along with, with the staff at the Maritime Museum <laughs> with, with, with some of the foods. Um, but it, it is something that, that it is a bonding experience. But more importantly, it's... it's it's putting you into the context of this little rock in the middle of the Mediterranean. I love the fact that court records preserve the recipe, that this was thought yes. to be, be relevant for the, the legal proceedings. That gives me the chance, Liam, to ask you how you got interested in archival records, museum objects in the first place. So looking back in your, you know, your youth or early university studies, where did it start? So, uh, <laughs> I, the short version is Errol Flynn. <laughs> um, uh, so so <laughs> that is the short version. As I used to spend my, my, my summers, uh, as you will know, Malta, it's very hot. So, so uh, after 11 o'clock until 3, it's either siesta or, or watching, watching, uh, watching TV. Back, uh, I, I'm talking back in the, in the late 80s. Um, and and uh, you know, I, I used to spend my time on these cassette players, uh, watching Robin Hood by Errol Flynn, Captain Blood, The Crimson Pirate, all these classic movies, which, which my grandfather had had in his in his library. Growing up next to the bastions of Valletta and Birgu, uh, growing up next to the sea, I so wanted to learn a little bit more what was happening here in Malta when Captain Blood was was in the Caribbean, and so. Little by little, uh, I started reading, uh, you know, getting getting all these books from, from the various libraries. And to cut a long story short, I was, you know, a snotty 16-year-old boy. Um, and, and I actually managed to find the telephone number uh, on, 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 on these old phone directories of Joseph Muscat, who was this, this 
amazing maritime historian. We, we can call him the godfather of Maltese maritime history, who was in his in his late 60s by, by then. And, and I called him up and I, I'm like, um, uh, Mr. Muscat, I'm, I'm so interested in your work. I have a couple of questions. Can I, can I ask you some questions? And I started asking him, according to him, because then we actually became colleagues and we wrote uh, articles together. He said, I, I wasn't sure that it was this 15, 16 year old boy asking me about where the, the hand coop goes on a galley or, or <laughs> what was the signal that, that, that the, the Capitana, the flagship used to raise to give biscotto uh, to all the crew. And he told me they were so strange that I had to meet you. We, we met up in, in Rabat at, at the National Archives. And I just went, I, I you know, at 16, I, I, was, I was allowed. And this, this is something which I, I cannot stress enough. I was allowed with reservations to handle original documents and then to be able to, to learn how to read these, these documents. I, I am lucky that I, I was from the generation where, where TV in Malta was not satellite. So it was um, antenna TV and we were getting Italian TV over. So I learned Italian through TV. And so I could read the Italian documents. Today with my students, it's quite a problem. Um, not a lot of the younger generation can read, can read Italian. But, you know, and it started from there. You know, I have visited the National Library of Malta, where, where AOM is, again, him is doing so much work there. I remember using the old microfilms, which mm -hmm. him used to, used to it was, was, was doing back in the 70s and, and the early 80s. Since then, I have visited the library surely, surely uh, once a month. The, the, so not, not to over accentuate a point, but, but surely. And that's it. I, 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 I got the bug and I, I can't get rid of it, fortunately. I love the idea that a kind of, you know, boyhood fantasy life of you know, swashbuckling and, you know, yeah. and all this kind of thing actually translated into what has become a career for you. And I, I think the other thing that struck me about what you just said was the fact that you found elders and institutions that were open to the curiosity of a young man. And I, I think that's a great lesson for us. Let's talk a little bit more about how you made the professional transition into maritime collections, particularly. So obviously, this was an interest, um, you know, ships and sailing and life on ships was an, was an early interest. But what made you think that studying this professionally could actually become a, a life path? You gave me a bit of my answer when, when you started talking about the swashbuckling stories, the adventures of Don Juan, for example. You know, the more I started reading, the more I started getting into the books, you find these swashbuckling stories, but then you get into the mundane. And the mundane um, at the prospect of, of, of giving away that, that we have a boring career as, as museum curators, but the mundane and the simple things were the things that started intriguing me. So uh, just to give you an idea, my late grandfather was a boat builder who, who always refused to teach me his profession and, and always told me, just go to school. And this is not this is not a place for you. He was a he was a carpenter and a boat builder, but I used to go to his to his to his workshop, and he had the original model that he had built as a, as a young apprentice to start this, and I used to um, clean this model and and start to appreciate the little details of where does this wood come from? We are you know you get shipwrights in Malta, you get boat builders, and there's no wood. What was happening? We are a nation at the end of the day that should not exist. To, to coin a term, just like Venice, it should not exist. So these questions started coming along. And I started to realize that back, in, back when I was younger, and there is a difference, this story was not out there. This story of the mundane was not there. Um, and, and, and I remember always, you know, reading, reading, um, uh, the lovely stories about, about, about museum collections abroad. 
Um, but what was the museum collection in Malta? And and I used to I used to visit the museums, see the collections, but there was something missing. And thankfully, by my my early years at, at university, the the new curators that were being were joining the, the National Agency for Museums were bringing this forward. I remember um, uh, an amazing exhibition um, uh, about Maltese clocks, which go hand in hand with maritime history. The sedan chair exhibition, the portable altar exhibition by by Patrimonio, and and. Suddenly, I could I could see all this around me, and I really wanted to turn it into a career. Um, and well, here I am. I strongly believe everything happens for a reason. And 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 when I finished university, at, at I wasn't even 21 years old. There there was a job opening at the Maritime Museum, and and and. I, I was so young. I, I, I and looking back today, I say I, I was, my God, I was still a boy. I was given this opportunity, and in fact, instead of the usual one-year probation, it was a six-month probation. Uh, you know, because it, I must admit, and I always say it to, to now my my colleagues, they took a pun on a on a young historian who only had one suit, which he used for funerals, weddings, and and any special occasions, <laughs> uh, and and. From then on, it, it, I, I, I kept on going and, and going. And when I asked them, why did you choose me? Um, because I knew who was, afterwards I got to know who was sitting for, for, for the job. They told me because you told, us, you told us that you had a thesis about food on board ship and how it can be applied in a museum. And well, it's the Maritime Museum, so, so this is what we want. Today, I would say, if I did not choose that that thesis, you know, it would have been a totally different story. I like the way that you you sort of turn to the fine grain of historical records, of the way that I think museums, research, um, academic publications have realized that the fine grain of daily life can illuminate so much about a much broader context and era, and I think you're emphasizing that in, in what you're saying here. Daniel, I'd like to turn back to you for a minute because I know that you've made a bit of a transition in your own academic work, working with me years and years ago on you know, the history of monasticism and sort of broader religious ideas and then the historical development of monastic communities and traditions in Europe. And you've now become a great expert in archives and this focus on the Order of St. John of Jerusalem, the Mediterranean world. Could you say a little bit about how that, what that transition has come to mean for you and how that has changed your way of looking at history? This is one of the reasons why Liam and I, I think, get along so well as colleagues, is that this position has actually allowed me to return to where history began for me as an intellectual curiosity in my youth which is the fact that I grew up in Western New York on the Niagara frontier, on the Great Lakes. And I was fully involved with the, to be fair, maritime history of the Great Lakes, specifically during the, what we call here in the United States, the French and Indian Wars. And then of course, with the American Revolution and the War of 1812, which a lot of people don't realize we actually had frigates on the Great Lakes at that time, as well as schooners and gunboats. And so being in Malta in some ways was a kind of a reminder of being born on a major body of water with its own ports and histories. And so a lot of it was coming home, but in a very different context. And because of the, the Order of St. John and the other religious orders on the island, I was able to merge that quite quickly into the long-term academic studies that I had developed at the university um, during my academic career. So it was, a, it, was all, it was a kind of a really happy moment for me to be able to bring my own personal interest in 18th and early 19th century history uh, together with uh, my own pursuit of the history of monasticism and religious communities. And to that, I would even add that, you know, Liam and I share our own pa passion and interest in Patrick O'Brien um, <laughs> in the Aubrey series. 
of which when we're reading and rereading it, we end up taking photographs of the pages and sending them to each other and saying, read this passage, it's so amazing. Um, in a way, it's been a very easy transition for me. The big change has been looking at archives in a way that I hadn't done before with my, my study of religious orders, which had focused primarily on standard manuscripts and early printed books. And so where Malta has a very large collection of manuscripts and early printed material, it's dwarfed by the kilometers of archival material that survives. And so it's been a, a new experience for me to learn about archives as repositories for religious history. Again, looking at these kind of things that Liam talks about, the uh, how these trial records or let's say death notices or wills and testaments uh, record the day-to-day -day activity of the lives of members of religious orders. In particular importance, of course, for me are the spolia of the knights, which are preserved in part at the cathedral archives, which again brings the, the question of why is this matter and why is this important to the point, which is these archives, even though they were microfilmed in the 1970s, have are in a desperate need in state of repair and conservation and re-digitization um, because of the fading, the faded ink that is in these documents. And yet I look at them and I say, these documents preserve the household, what the knight had in their possession at the moment of death, and then how it was redistributed and what that meant. And you know from your own life, Coloma, that monastic communities and religious communities um, share the belongings of, of the member when, when they die. And so this tells a, a lot about how, not only about the legality of possessions, but also the issues of how a community understands wealth and redistribution in order so that it can survive. And the different variances of classes within an institution, particularly of the Knights, because some Knights came from very, very, very wealthy families and some came from smaller noble families. Uh, Daniel, as long as I've known you, I didn't know that stuff about interested in the maritime history of the Great Lakes. <laughs> and it, it just makes me think of something I often share with people. And that is, the United States was essentially founded on lakes and rivers. And until you built the interstate highway system, for example, that's how things moved. That's how um, the, the sort of, you know, settlement of Europeans in North America happened was following those natural pathways. And we've forgotten them. Uh, Malta, you can't forget the fact that you're surrounded by water. So uh, the maritime is part of the living experience uh, in a way that, you know, in some ways in, in our country, we've kind of forgotten where we came from in, in that respect. When the museum reopens and we have the experience of going there, and seeing what you've done in the renovation, what kind of things would we find there? And what would you take us to? The exact name is Malta Maritime Museum. We choose that because it remains the same with um, in Maltese. Museo Maritimo da Malta. We have a story to tell. From the first day that man set foot on the island until yesterday. That's a very, very long story. Now, obviously, we have eras, epochs, and periods where we have next to nothing to show with regards to archives or with regards to artifacts. And then we have eras that are extremely, extremely full to the brim with objects. That part where we are full to the brim with objects is the part where we would call it the early modern period until the Arab Spring, because we actually have artifacts from the Arab Spring. The flying suit of one of the Mirage pilots that actually escaped um, from Tripoli um, when he was given the order by Gaddafi himself to bombard Benghazi. And he flew a fully uh, loaded um, uh, Assault Mirage, um, a French uh, built Mirage fighter jet um, illegally, but and escaping Libya all the way to Malta. They were, they were too. Um, so you have such an artifact such as this, 
Then you have, the, for example, the largest Roman anchor in existence in the world, 4.2 tons of lead, which is part of the national collection. But then you have, as I was saying, 1530 until 1979, where we have the bulk of the collection. And I'm going to be biased. Um, because the, uh, a curator can be biased. You can have your... Uh, uh, I, when I say this to my dad, he's not impressed. I, I, I always tell him, you have to have your favorite, ch your, your favorite child. Um, and, and we do have, and I personally have, my favorite artifacts in the museum. And those are mostly belonging to um, this period, 1537, uh, 1979. And if I'm really honest with you, it's, it's 1530. Uh, 1815, but but there are some artifacts which go beyond 1815, and that brings me to to to, to answer your second question: What would I take you to see? Um, and you know, one one of the things that I I would surely show uh, with regards to something which is an impact, um, I would say we just bought um, uh, now two years ago already. Through funds that we raise with our with our um, food events, um, uh, two harbor views of the island of Malta, and one of them depicts the possessor of the fleet by Grandmaster Emmanuel Pinto. The possessor of the fleet was the same thing. Uh, to describe it is what the Doge would do in Venice when he married. The, um, the sea, when he threw the wedding ring into the sea um, uh, every, every year. And this was, or when he came into power, sorry, not every year. And this is the same depiction of Grandmaster Pinto taking possession of the fleet and taking possession of the harbor of Moda, which was the backdrop and the, the theatrical space for the Order of St. John to show their worldly power and also their religious power over the island, but more importantly, when it comes to religiously and, and also, also politically, Europe. It's a beautiful painting. The details are, are amazing. And it, it throws light on one fact, that the Order of St. John were in control of a sea power state. Now, this is not a, a, um, a sea power in the sense that 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 uh, Mahan will would 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 be talking about when he was talking about global sea power. We are talking about sea power state, small s, small p, and small s. It is. A useless, when it comes to being a, a, an empire, it's, it's not that. It, it's, there's nothing. We are on the frontier. Um, you can call us frontier of Europe, frontier of Africa, frontier of the Levant, uh, <laughs> frontier of the Mediterranean. You choose, you choose your title. But the sea is the key element of the island. Unlike Corsica, unlike Sardinia, unlike Crete, the island was accentuating one thing, the sea. The sea was the bridge to the rest of the world. The sea was the bridge for you to be a part of an economic structure, which was extremely, extremely lucrative for hundreds, um, if not thousands of merchants coming to the island and making the island their home. In 1530, there were 20,000 people living on the island. By 1798, so around 40 years after this painting was painted, there were 120, 150,000 people living on the island. You had a new capital city built by Grandmaster de Vallette, who was actually a corsair. And now our capital city is still named after him. You had fortifications so large uh, and so strong that, that Winston Churchill would say, this is the unsinkable aircraft carrier. He said a lot of things. He also said there was more water in his whiskey than in his bath at Malta. So <laughs> it's, it's, it, but these are, I love these little quotes because they give us context. If I can choose another artifact, the ship models owned by the Order of St. John, which are conserved at the Maritime Museum. They were part of the University of Malta. 
these large models were actually found at university. Thanks to the research that, that we are able to do at the archive, we managed to find the exact day that Grandmaster Pinto went to visit the university to see these models. And so you are bringing the archive and the model together. And this is where, you know, I go, I, 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 I say, you know, we are very lucky to be doing this job because we actually have the tools to succeed because you've got the archives and you've got the artifact and you can merge them. We have better tools to succeed because we have these documents online and I can, I can study them in the comfort of my own home and, and have my Ulrika moments uh, instead of at the library and having, having you know, a two hour time window at the library, I, I have a, a 24 hour time window uh, at the library. And that brings me to, for example, another artifact, which is a crew list um, of a Maltese Corsair ship captained by Captain Guglielmo Lorenzi, who uh, was a Corsican, um, came to Malta as a, an 11 year old boy and ended up being, being um, one of the more successful Corsairs on the island, um, buying a, a beautiful palace in Valletta from a, a spolio that, 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 that Daniel was just mentioning of, of, of a Knight of St. John. And the order actually pocketed the money um, instead of keeping the house, and he 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 bought it. He he bought the house, becoming an admiral for Catherine the Great of Russia, because um, back in the 18th century, uh, Catherine the Great was fighting against the Ottoman Empire and trying to reconquer Crimea, and ending up being shot um, in 1799 as a Maltese patriot um, uh, fighting the French who had been led onto the island by another Corsican upstart. And, and that's uh, as far as I go with titles um, uh, of General Bonaparte. These are the artifacts that I would be showing you. I would be showing you uh, ship models, for example, from the 19th century of ship constructors who had arrived in Malta in the very early 18th century with a knowledge of ship construction from Toulon, Rochefort, um, uh, and, and, and bringing that knowledge to the Maltese dockyard. And, and I'll show you these models. And I'll, I'll tell you, listen, these are wooden ships being built in Malta all throughout the 18th century, but the glory days and the golden age, and I use golden age because uh, I'm scared of using these terms, golden age, what's the golden age? but the golden age of Maltese shipbuilding of a, a 220 foot bark built in Malta to sail from Malta all the way to Canada to bring wheat to the island because now Crimea is in the hands of the Russians and the Maltese cannot go to Crimea to bring in the wheat. Uh, and, and, and so they had to turn to Canada, bringing it here. And I'll show you this model and I'll tell you, there's no wood on the island there's not even um, there's no metal on the island for you to have the, the the iron nails to build this ship. There isn't even the wood to put into the furnace to burn the fire to melt the metal to turn this into nails, so that you can start thinking of building these ships. The museum and the objects that we have has to teach us a few things, but one of them is this island should not exist as we know it today. And we need to learn why it exists through these documents and through these archives. If you go through the names of these ship constructors, German, Mirabitur, Borc, Schembri, Mitrovic, you, you listen to these names and you go, these are from all over the place, from, uh, from the Dalmatian coast, from Italy, from France, from England. Yes, because this is an island on the crossroads. I think a lot of people, when you mention the word museum or you mention the word archive, they think of these as sort of time capsules, which might be kind of interesting just to see how people lived in the past. But I think all three of us would agree that these have things to tell us about the present and even the future. How would you explain to people the significance of the Maritime Museum collection, for example, in helping them make sense of the world today and potentially even the future. 
a museum is nostalgia. A museum is an identity. But a museum is a tool to create, the, to, to help these two, but also to defeat those two. An identity is extremely important. The museum is a tool for us to, to give an identity to the people that live on the island. A tool to, to teach people that the island made money out of slavery, but also to teach that on the island, there was always religious tolerance. On the island, there was always a hospital to care for the sick, regardless of your faith. And back then in, in Malta, it was Orthodox, Muslim, Jew, or Catholic. On the island of, of, of Malta, you had a people made for the sea or, or sired by the sea. And then that brings me to nostalgia. And nostalgia is, is something that the museum actually jumps on the bandwagon of nostalgia when we're talking about taste history. Where, where oh, how, how this is how good the food was back then. Today, you know, it, it's, it's all processed food and, and all that. And oh, how, how good it was back in the day. And yes, there are there are those things, and and when and I agree with those who say that. But then I remind them about, about the dentist back in the 18th <laughs> back in the 18th century, and, and I tell them yes, it was good cheese, it was very good wine, because these guys were drinking you know um, a nice Chablis from Burgundy or 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 a lovely sweet uh, Moscat de Alexandria from from South Africa in 1797 Malta. To, to show you globalization is, is, is nothing new. But then we have the power. It is our duty to remind people that nostalgia can be dangerous. And, and this is not the museum's view, but this is only my view. Nostalgia gave the world Brexit. And uh, in a European context, that is, that is something that, that you, know, you need to, to understand and see, all right, this is where we came from. This is where we are today. But let's see where we are going. And where we are going means that we cannot what, you know, turn the clock back. But we need to learn from mistakes. We need to learn also from good things that happened. Mm -hmm. you know, that was good administration. And again, we are very lucky that the, the Order of St. John was extremely bureaucratic. And we have all the details there. We know how the order operated. The charitable institutions instituted by the Order of St. John. I was amazed with the work that, that Himmel did with the confraternity archives of Valletta. And you start to realize what these charitable institutions were doing on the island and how important they were to us back then and how important they are today for us, where the Catholic Church is working in our society, in our communities. It's just Beautiful, if I, if, if I may use that word. But more importantly, again, and I, I, I land it here, it's our responsibility to remind the world and to remind the Maltese that, that these things were here for a reason. And there was always um, these institutions were so important for us that we still feel their impact today. And we hope that we can still be feeling that um, in, in the years to come. So, Daniel, how do you answer the archives? So what? question. <laughs> Here I'm going to speak uh, very specifically to my experience in Malta and what I have discovered in my time over the last almost a decade, and that is the archives matter to what Liam pointed out, which is a sense of not only individual or family, but also communal and transnational identity. The biggest thing that I find value in in the archives is that their sheer existence allows us to break down our prejudices, to truly look at each level of who we are as a community, from the micro community of friends all the way through a state to international relations and point a finger at what we conceive to be our good ideas as to have been ideas done by people in the past and often more successfully than we do now. And it's a, it's a reminder of humility. 
and what's been lost, but what can also be recovered and used to help us um, as we move forward. I mean, I look at Malta and it is such a polyglot place. At the same time, it's a place of different peoples coming and going all of the time, sometimes briefly, sometimes over long periods of time. It's a place of both immigration and migration. People both leave and come to it. It's a nexus of multiple cultures being brought together and then also turned into something new and unique on its own. I'm always reminded when I visit there, and this is something that I share very closely with, with Liam, is that there are two public house museums, more or less, that you can visit. There's the Casa Roca Piccola, which is still a residence of the Marquis de Piro, and also the Palazzo Fazzon in Nemdina. There may be others, but those are the two I'm most familiar with. But when you walk into these homes, you see families that go back generations and generations and generations and holding on to their culture and material history and preserving it as part of this, this dynamic. And that history itself includes marriages from families from other parts of Europe. There are sons and daughters who then either leave or come home and leave and establish relationships abroad. The things they bring back with them, the correspondence that's found in the archives, very detailed, very personal correspondence. And I think Malta is a place where you can simply say, we underestimate the amount of historical knowledge and value, both on individual lives, but also on state lives and international relationships. So this is the thing that I find so valuable about this. And it it to me is something worth exploring. I don't think there's anybody in the world who can go to Malta and not find something about their identity in Maltese archives. It is truly that international in scope. So a final question, and I'm going to roll two topics we normally cover into one. And I'll ask you both to respond again, starting with Liam. So I want to ask you both to respond to the question, why does cultural preservation matter? And then related to that, does cultural preservation and the work that both of you have given your lives to in some way bring you hope? Let's go for a, for a world exclusive um, during during this, this, this lovely conversation. Um, uh, and, and I'll give this example to, to uh, and in this example, in this case study, if, if I may use a, a technical term, um, I, you will have the answer for 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 these 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 two questions. When I started out at the museum, as I as I uh, as I said, I was I was quite young, and and the the curator before me, you know, you have this this transition through him, and he used to t tell me these stories, and 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 you know, this object is this, this object is that, and and there is always a story behind an object. But there are these urban myths. Um, and, and one of these myths that, that Antonio Espinosa Rodriguez, the, the founder of the museum told me was that there was once this ship constructor that commissioned a sculptor who used to do holy um, statues in, in Malta for the Madonna or, or for St. Joseph to, come, um, to, to create a figurehead for the ship that he was building. And this figurehead was so beautiful that the ship constructor refused to use it on his clipper ship. Uh, it was a, a ship type, which was a clipper. And so, um, because it was an image of himself, of this ship constructor. And he kept this at home. And you know, it, it's it maybe sometimes we call them old wife's tales, and 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 we we giggled about it and said, yeah, right. You know, back in back in the 19th century, knowing how how expensive such such a figurehead would have been, I we're not sure that this guy would have would have done this. And but you know, maybe it, it's somewhere or now it's 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 lost. On Monday, as I. Um, came back to work from 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 our 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 um, Christmas holidays. I, I, I get this this email. Um, uh, dear dear Mr. Gauchi, I'm 
I've got some artifacts maybe you'll be interested in. I, I'm not sure. Maybe um, they're, they're, they belong to my to my wife. Um, can can you come along and 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 see these these objects? And I asked the, the gentleman behind the email to, to send me a couple of photos. And he sent me the photos. And and I I, I was I was doing the same thing. I I, I couldn't I couldn't even speak. I, I I see the image of this figurehead, of this ship portrait, of the same ship, um, and I go. I, I get I get the phone. I call I call this gentleman who's who's 78 years old, and I tell him, "That's Mirabitur," and he goes, uh, "Yes. How do you know? Um, that's that's my 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 wife's maiden name." I tell him, I, I was I, I wasn't I wasn't making sense in my sentences. Within 48 hours, we were at this gentleman's uh, lovely home in uh, in uh, in Mosta. Um, uh, we collected this, this, um, uh, the figurehead and the, the ship portrait and the ship model from around 1850. This family had been in Malta since the 1770s, brought over by the Order of St. John to build ships for the Order of St. John, and they actually stayed in Malta. And when I was speaking to this lady who, who was telling me all the story about the figurehead and how her great aunt had told her never let, let it go out of the family um, and the story and, and she corroborated the story that we knew. She corroborated and she gave us more information because the statue actually has um, a sculpture of, of the ship constructor's dog um, just ne next, to, next to his feet. And we were wrapping this, this figurehead in bubble wrap um, to carry it out. And, and this lady started crying um, uh, in, in, in front of me. And, and even talking to you about it, you know, it, it's getting me emotional. And, and that's why museums matter. That's why we matter when we are doing this kind of job. Because she started crying and, and she told me, those are my memories. That's my family that you are taking to the museum. That's the memory of me, of my great aunt, of my family, of my children who grew up opening Christmas presents next to, next to this figurehead. And I actually, I, I, I was lost for words. And I told her, I, this figurehead is coming to a good home. We are going to preserve it. We are going to tell the story about your family to the rest of Malta and to the rest of the world. It is a perfect example of this is why cultural preservation matters. Be it a, a receipt of um, uh, salami ingredients to a beautiful um, sculpture of Giuseppe Mirabitur from 1762, uh, 1862, sorry. Thank you, that's, that's great. So Daniel? cultural heritage preservation matters because it provides us all of the ingredients and tools to discover things about who we are as ourselves, things about who we can be, recovering knowledge lost, building knowledge to, to put something forward to the future. But at the same time, it can be turned into something negative. And I'm always leery about that part of cultural heritage preservation. What gives me hope is that we live in a society where we can have these debates about why it matters and what can be done with that. And I wanna do what Liam did is, is focus on a, two small things that have, I've encountered in my time um, to explain you know, why this matters or what can happen with it. One is, of course, the recent digitization project that we did at the Sisters of Santa Ursula in Valletta, an archive which was closed to the public and inaccessible to the public. But at the same time, because of the nature of the religious community of women, they're closely tied to the administrative history of the order, but also to the spirituality of the order. 
but at the same time closely tied to the maritime history of the island because the sisters received a large part of their revenue from the corsairing activity. And Liam, of course, has studied these documents. Preservation here matters because it gives us an incredible amount of hope of uncovering lost history by creating access to previously inaccessible documents. It reminds me of my colleague Valeri Venezia, Venezio, who was doing the metadata cataloging for me, discovering in those documents food recipes and implements and ingredients that were identical to what she used in her family in southern Italy and Malia. So there's kind of connection of hope and thoughtfulness there. At the same time, I, I look at a lot of the work we've been doing on the France and Malta and the Age of Revolution project and the questions that it brings about with regard to understandings of identity, liberty, nationalism, and how these revolutionary movements in the Mediterranean are the same vexing questions that uh, confront us today. Uh, what does it mean to be a part of a liberal democratic society? What does it mean to be uh, sovereign? And these questions, which can turn, they turn very quickly into you know, positive ways of creating a, a, a global, fair, democratic structure and society can also be turned very quickly into something very negative and controlling and violent and exclusive. And so... I think there's a lot of hope that in allowing us to revisit all of this, both the personal, the regional, but also the, the meta questions that still confront us today. I want to thank both of you for joining me today for this conversation. I think I have a couple of takeaways. One of my takeaways is envy for the two of you, because you work with more recent history. I mean, the fact, Liam, that you could engage with this woman who said, pointed at an object and said, those are my memories, a living link. And for someone who works in the history of early Christianity, uh, that's not so easy for me to do. <laughs> you, you, you come across an inscription or there's some kind of comment in a manuscript. So I love that realization that we do have living links to history even 200 years ago. And that part of what we're trying to do is to keep those voices alive. My second takeaway from both of you is the point about the danger of nostalgia and of misuse of the past. That it is so easy for us to have assumptions about the way things were, or to have assumptions about the founding of our countries or what brought us to the present day. And this underscores the importance of what Himmel does. So our goal is to collect the evidence and then put it out there so that people can listen to the voices of the past and make informed judgments about what the past may have been like and therefore inform the decisions that we make about the present and the future. One of our common themes here is precisely that listening to the voices of the ancestors. And both of you do that in your complementary ways and that is certainly at the heart of what Himmel does. And thank you for that reminder. So I want to encourage those who watch this program to share it by letting people know where it lives on YouTube. And I'd encourage you also to go back and look at the other episodes of this three season series if you haven't had the chance. So I know on behalf of everybody watching this, you share my gratitude to our guests. And uh, we hope to see you again sometime. Thank you. <laughs>